Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Tonight is our uh, July meeting in 2021. For better or for worse, I think it's gonna be for better. This is our last 100% virtual presentation. The rest of our meetings will be a combination of virtual and in person at the Savin Hill Yacht Club for the rest of this year and, and hopefully going forward. Um, and we're greatly appreciative of the fact that Shelly Brown came to us and agreed to give this presentation during the pandemic because she does live down in Newport, but still getting up to Boston is a bit of a stretch. So one of the wonders of having the digital era now is that we're able to bring in people from farther away. Um, Shelly is the director of the Sailors for the Sea, which is powered by Oceana. Uh, it's a world leading conserv ocean conservation organization. It engages, educates, and activates the boating community toward restoring ocean health. She's a native Rhode Islander, spent a lot of time on the water, um, she's got a doctoral degree from URI, and is obviously very passionate about educating people on how to make our waters, continue to be our waters for longer with, with good eco-friendly um, sailing and boating. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shelly because she can talk about this so much better than I can. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. I'm going to share my screen. So give me one second. Uh, okay. Can everybody see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris, and the Plagic Sailing Club for inviting me to speak today on the behalf of Sailors for the Sea. You guys just being a part of, you know, the intro here, it, it sounds like you're such a great group of boaters, uh, very passionate and, um, yeah, really excited to be able to speak to all of you today and jealous of the people that are out on the water. Um, it's really awesome. So, yeah, as Chris mentioned, I'm the director of Sailors for the Sea, powered by Oceana. And I grew up right on the shores of Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island and spent many summer days on the water. As a family, we used to sail from Long Island Sound, New York, all the way up the coast of Maine. And, you know, my passion from ocean and sailing um, and exploring the shores of Rhode Island led me to go get a degree in marine science. But I wanted to go further than that. Once I finished my degree, I wanted to bridge the gap between the science world and the public and be a part of a science-based organization that was engaging and activating people to really make a difference for our waterways. So, and that led me to Sailors at Sea. So here, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick history and then dive into the, the eco-smart tips um, for green boating. But uh, David Rockefeller Jr. and Dr. David Treadway, they are added sailors themselves and they saw, you know, the sailing community, boaters, they see the issues on the water and they wanted to unite the sailing and boating community to take action for our waters. So they founded Sailors for the Sea in 2004 with the mission to inspire, educate and activate boaters to protect our waters. So we are based in Newport, Rhode Island but we work with boaters across the globe. And we have three core programs. So um, our most well-known program is called Clean Regattas. It's a sustainability certification for any water-based event. So if you're hosting a regatta or even at your club, we provide a framework of different best practices. Um, it helps support events to reduce their environmental impact from eliminating single-use plastics to preventing toxins from entering the water. And we're actually just celebrating today our 15 year anniversary of the Clean Regattas program. So we've worked with 2,800 events and 750,000 sailors across the globe on this program. Our next program is called KELP, which stands for Kids Environmental Lesson Plans. And so this is a really great program. Like if you have kids or grandkids, um, there's 50 different activities on our website for kids to really understand our oceans. And we originally created this program for sailing instructors to use on no wind or rainy days to really help kids understand what's happening underneath their hulls. And a lot of the activities are building different scientific equipment or playing different types of games to understand the issues that are impacting our oceans like overfishing, plastic pollution, a variety of things. So those are kind of our two legacy core programs. 
But what I really wanna focus on today is green voting. And so um, as many boaters, I'm sure like many other boaters, while you're on the water, you see the destruction humans are having on our oceans. Those pesky mylar balloons, water bottles, plastic bags, all types of plastic waste floating in the water. Maybe you've seen sea level rise, or we were just talking about the hurricane, you know, hurricane damage happening in your harbor or marina due to the impacts of climate change, or oil spills, um, runoff negatively impacting our coastal ecosystems, or even harm to marine life like this whale that's entangled in fishing gear. It can be, as a boater being on the water, it can be really disheartening to see, to see these things. So, but witnessing these issues firsthand, we as boaters have a powerful voice to advocate for our oceans. And we can do things as individuals on our own boats and be leaders and models for others, and also as a community of boaters to protect our waterways. So whether you are new to green boating or you know, you're already doing things that you're, in, you know, you're environmentally minded already, um, I'm hoping you come away learning with some new information and some practical tips that you can hopefully implement on your boat or maybe it, even in your own lives at home. So first off, how as boaters can we protect our waterways? You know, we think about this all the time. Um, we think about, you know, I'm gonna focus on the things that we can have the that have the biggest impact on our waterways. So I've categorized the tips under three overarching green boating practices that I'm going to call, call the three Bs. And I just want to preface that all the tips I'm sharing here today are included in our green boating guide, where you can go to our website and we have all these tips um, separated by topic. But you can also download the full green boating guide. So just letting you know ahead of time. But the the three Bs. So be careful what goes into the water be aware of wildlife and habitat, and then be an advocate for our oceans. So the first, be careful about what goes into the water. If you take a step back and you think of all the different types of things that can go in the water, it can be a long list. You know, soapy water from cleaning your boat, sewage discharge, small spills from filling up your fuel tank, um, maybe pumping out your bilge that has oil in it, or the gray water from showering or cleaning your dishes. You know, there's a variety of different ways to minimize what goes into the water or to make sure that what's going into the water is less likely to harm the environment. So I'm gonna talk about three potential pollutants that may end up in our waterways and what we can do about them. So I'm sure many of you probably recognize this symbol. So I'm gonna, and you're well aware of the issue, so I'll keep this one brief, but black water or sewage discharge has many negative impacts on coastal ecosystems. The excess nutrients going to the water can cause algal blooms, which can lead to dead zones and fish kills. Black water also carries disease causing um, organisms, which you know I don't wanna go swimming with that and you don't wanna be eating the shellfish that's exposed to that. And then you have chemicals that, are, that you potentially put in your toilets and holding tanks that can also be toxic to marine life. So how do you manage your black water on board? Obviously, you want to use your toilets and holding tanks appropriately, um, but one of the keys to managing black water is to be able to identify pump out stations in, um, in your area and where do you, you plan to travel. In some areas, even have pump out boats that will come to your boat as well. So a good thing to do is, you know, do a quick Google search to see where the pump out stations are. The challenging part is maybe you're planning a trip or chartering a boat perhaps in the Caribbean, they don't necessarily have these type of facilities or you know, pump out stations available. So just doing your research ahead of time um, and knowing if there's pump out stations available and knowing where the no discharge zones are too, because they have higher levels of um, not pumping out your sewage. So for example, I believe Buzzards Bay is a no discharge zone. And so if you choose, if you don't have a pumping out station near you, um, make sure that you're at least three miles offshore um, before you pump out your sewage. So if you're in a marina, I'm sure you all recognize this rainbow. Um, filling up our fuel tanks is one of the most common ways that we unintentionally pollute our waters. And even a tiny smell, spill is toxic to our waterways and it can harm both animals and plants. We always think of like those big giant spills as causing problems and they definitely do like the deep water horizon, definitely significant impact. 
But this 64% of oil and fuel that enters North American marine waters each year is from land-based runoff and from recreational boats. So the small, small spills really do add up. And the cost to prevent a fuel spill is significantly less than the cost to actually clean that spill up. So the first thing you want to do is, you know, check your fuel lines and tanks for any damage. If you see any leaking in your bulge, you want bilge, you want to make sure that you're, you know, addressing that, that problem. Knowing the capacity of your fuel tank and how much fuel you need to get at the um, fuel dock is great as well. You know, our uh, tanks on boats are not pressurized like the tanks, fuel tanks in a car, so the automatic shutoff valve doesn't work. So you want to make sure that you're paying, really paying attention. I heard some stories where people were chatting and oil or fuels just leaking directly into the water, which, you know, that's, that's a huge problem. And there's also different products that you could potentially buy to even capture those small spills. Um, you can use a bib that goes around your, your fuel intake, or this, this is a collar here that you can put around the fuel nozzle, and those will catch any type of drips that might potentially leak into the water. And it's always great to have a spill kit on board, um, but just in case something happens that you can put it in the water. And then if you do have a spill that does cause a sheen, you want to contact the marina or the Coast Guard to let them know so they can properly take care of it. And another great thing to have is in your bilge is having one of those absorbent uh, pillows or pads to clean up any oil before you discharge your bilge as well. And then finally, you want to be extra cautious with portable fuel cans because um, when you're filling up your dinghy, for example, uh, according to the EPA, over 70,000 gallons of fuel is spilled by the use of portable fuel cans every year. And so it's, you know, if you're not on a balanced surface, it can be really challenging to make sure that you don't drip anything in. So just be, be super cautious with portable fuel, fuel cans. And the last pollutant I wanna talk about is cleaning products. So we all wanna keep our the inside and outside of our boats clean and in tip top condition, but many cleaning products are harmful to aquatic life water quality and the overall ecosystems. Um, most cleaning products are not made to be directly released into our waterways. Some chemicals can cause damage to fish tissues while others create those nutrient imbalances that lead to the algal blooms. Um, many cleaning products are actually meant to go through a wastewater treatment facility where the majority of contaminants and chemicals are removed before the water goes back into rivers, lakes, and the ocean. So I have a few tips um, to that hopefully will help on how to properly clean your boats to limit the impact on our waterways. So regularly rinsing your boat and boat parts with fresh water will really help prevent, you know, grime from building up. So try to try to do that often. Um, if you have a smaller you know, dinghy or you're cleaning life jackets, try to use a designated washdown area at your marina um, if they have that or clean items in grass, which help absorb runoff before that goes back into the ocean. Choosing cleaning products that are less harmful to the environment is also great. I'm gonna talk about that in a couple, couple seconds, um, but making sure that you use the right products that, that are going to be less harmful to the environment. And then try to use cleaning products sparingly and maybe a little extra elbow grease instead. So it can be really, if you're shopping you know, for a cleaning product, it can be really challenging to find the right eco-friendly product because you know you really have to watch out for greenwashing. Not all um, manufacturers are not required to list the ingredients of their product on the on the actual product so you don't know exactly what's in the products and there's no regulation on the green words so they can use eco-friendly, um, green, non-toxic, all those different type of, types of words and they're actually there's no regulation on them. So you really wanna make sure that you're doing your research ahead of time. So we suggest using the EPA Safer Choice. So you can plug in your cleaning product and they can tell you, um, they have a special label on the products and they can tell you if it, it falls in line with their regulations. You can also go to the Environmental Working Group's Guide to Clean Healthy Cleaning and type in your product. But the problem with marine products is they're not always found in these, um, these two websites. Um, so we recommend using EcoWorks Marine as a really great brand or Simple Green as well. And in our green boating guide, we also, Boat, Boat US Foundation did a really great research study, 
I think in 2006, comparing a variety of different cleaning products and showing their toxicity, biodegradability, and how well they cl actually clean the boats. And they just updated their research with all, and all, a lot of those project products went out of date. So they just did an updated research um, report, I think two years ago, that we have included in our green boating guide as well, that really shows you know, which products actually work and are non-toxic to the environment. So we have that link in our green voting guide if you wanna dive into some more research on cleaning products. And the other thing you can do is actually make your own homemade cleaners. You know, during the pandemic, I feel like a lot of people were doing a lot of do-it-yourself type things. Um, so you probably have a lot of these, you may already have a lot of these in your pantry or on your boat, but with these seven items, you can clean most things on your boat. So here, both vinegar and lemon juice are acidic. They're a strong cleaning agent. They dissolve dirt, grime, debris, and they're also antibacterial, but they're not a disinfectant. Um, baking soda and cream of tartar are slightly abrasive, and they are also a great cleaning agent. Baking soda is alkaline or mildly alkaline, and cream of tartar is mildly acidic. So you just want to make sure if you're using them around, you know, different depending on what type of metals you're using. So you don't want to use baking soda on aluminum. Um, you instead want to use cream of tartar so it doesn't oxidize the aluminum. And then borax is another strong agent that can get rid of stains, mold, mildew, and neutralize odors. Salt is a great gentle scouring. So if you have something that's really hard to get off, um, it helps boost the cleaning action and deodorizing action of other ingredients. It really helps, helps get things clean. And then finally, hydrogen peroxide is a natural disinfectant that is antibacterial and antiviral. So just a couple quick cleaners that you could potentially make. Um, an all-purpose cleaner, this one's great. One cup of white vinegar and a gallon of water um, will clean most parts of the outside of your boat. It's really great. You can also make um, a spray bottle with one cup of white vinegar with one cup of water. If you wanna put some lemon rind in it, it smells really good. Um, so that's a great all-purpose cleaner. For a stain remover on fiberglass, you can make a paste with, you know, equal parts baking soda, a little bit of water, use a scrub brush or a cloth, and that helps remove any stains on fiberglass. We get a lot of questions about how to properly clean sails, um, and you want to make sure that you're not too aggressive with sails because they're made out of, you know, special materials, and we don't want to damage them, obviously. Um, but borax, um, if used properly, is not as aggressive as like other products like bleach and things like that. So if you use one to two cups of borax with a gallon of warm water, you wash your your sail ahead of time, and then you can kind of spot clean, and then rinse with water and let it. Um, dry in the sun, it usually gets out all different kinds of stains, which is great. And then life jackets are another thing that, you know, they can get mildy, um, moldy and mildewy. So if you want to clean those, again, the white vinegar with a gallon of water, you can soak it for 30 minutes, rinse it and let it sit in the sun. And that usually helps um, to really get mildew off. One part lemon juice and one part salt with a, with a cloth or a scrub brush will get all of those stains out. And then you also don't want to forget other sources of gray water. So it's not just cleaning, but what, uh, what about other things that may end up in the ocean? If you're you know, showering on board, you want to be careful of the shampoos, body soaps, laundry detergents, dish soaps that you're using, and kind of look at the same method um, as the cleaning products. It's a lot easier with these on like that um, environmental working group website to look up your products and to make sure that they're eco-friendly. Eco So our next B is be aware of marine wildlife and habitat. One of the many joys, and I'm sure that you all experience this, um, is you know being out in nature, is being able to see all the different types of animals and wildlife. Um, as boaters, there's you know steps that we can take to preserve and protect our coastal ecosystems and marine wildlife. So first off, it's important to know what types of animals are found in your region you know, from seabirds to sea turtles to whales. Um, again, doing a quick Google search, you can see which species are in your region or where you're gonna be traveling. And just note that some species are migratory, like um, different types of whales will be in an area at different times of the year. So, and it's great if you know what animals are there, it's, you know, it's really fun to try to look for them as well. 
a good rule of thumb is when you're viewing wildlife is to remain at least 300 feet away and limit your viewing time to about 30 minutes, especially if there's other boats that see, for example, a whale um, in the region as well, to not disturb their, their uh, normal behavior. This picture here was actually taken from this past weekend, um, right off of Block Island, a whale collided with a boat out there. So, you know, it's not just the concern of, and I believe they knocked the knocked a person overboard. So it's not just the concern of, you know, protecting the wildlife, which is really important, but it, you know, a ship strike with a whale can be potentially dangerous for our, you know, yourself in your boat as well. You know, a female humpback whale can grow up to 52 feet and weigh over 65,000 pounds. That is a big creature. So you just want to make sure that you know the animals that are in your region, try to remain, if you do see them, stay away at least 300 feet um, and limit your viewing time to 30 minutes. If you do see a whale and um, you're going to look for it, you want to avoid a head-on approach um, because their eyes are on the side of their head and they're coming towards you. So obviously you want to avoid that and do go up alongside them or slightly from behind. Um, and if you're sailing, the best thing to do is to drop your sails and turn your engine on. If you drop your sails and have your engine on, then you can have easier maneuverability because once these wheels go down, it's sometimes unpredictable where they're going to come back up. Um, and the engine also helps because sailboats are pretty quiet in the water and the engine will help let them know where you are so they can try to avoid you, which is, which is good. And there's a really cool app. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's called the Whale Alert app. And that will let you know in your region, um, I think it's mostly in the Atlantic, um, if there's going to be whales in your, in your area. So just to be on the lookout for different types of whales. And I think you can also report whale sightings on that app as well. And finally, you can be eyes on the water. So you know, if you do see an uh, entangled or endangered or dead marine animal, it's really important to report that. And so I think the best thing to do is try to call the Coast Guard and they can, you know, contact the appropriate authorities. But, um, you know, people can go out and try to help save them if they are entangled. Um, it's good to know, you know, what caused the death of the animal, for example, if you find a dead marine animal. So boaters can be really great eyes on the water. And one animal I want to talk in particular about is the North Atlantic right whale, which is a critically endangered whale. There's only about 360 individuals left in the world. And, um, you know, the two greatest threats facing their survival is ship strikes and getting entangled in fishing gear. So these whales, they lack a dorsal fin, so you can't see that in the water. They skim feed, which means they just are eating at the surface and they move fairly slowly. Um, so they were known as the right whale to kill for um, when, way back in the whaling times. So that's how they got their name because they're slow, they float, um, all those different types of things. So if you do see them, since they're critically endangered, you actually have to stay 500 yards away from North Atlantic right whales. And it's great if you do see them to report any type of sighting. So um, that's also good to do in calling the Coast Guard to do that. Um, <clears throat> there's another alert system that NOAA uses to let you know when North Atlantic right whales are in the region. So I've signed up for that. And it just sends me emails of, you know, where the North Atlantic right whales are. I think in March, they spotted about 90 of them in Cape Cod Bay. So um, it tells you where they are and, you know, if to, you should keep your eyes out for them. So we also wanna protect sensitive marine habitats such as coral reefs, seagrass beds, and shellfish beds. These are essential habitats. Coral reefs and seagrass beds are important nurseries for many, many different types of species. Seagrass beds also sequester more carbon than terrestrial trees and are important habitats for combating climate change. So seagrass beds in most coral reefs need light. So they'll be found in shallow um, depths. And so you may be able to see them. So identifying where they are um, is the first step. And then um, you can utilize you know, different charts, fishing maps, or local boating guides to help you also get familiar with the, the areas you're gonna be boating in and try to avoid anchoring in these sensitive, ha sensitive habitats to prevent damage. And then try to, again, anchor in mud or, or sand instead. 
And then if you're in an area that does have seagrass bed, an emerging threat for seagrass um, is crop scars or sea seagrass scars. So if you're you know, boating in a very shallow area, if the boat's um, propeller or actually the boat itself can, comes in contact with seagrass, it can grind up the sandy substrate root system and the seagrasses and it actually leaves a scar that's visible from above. So you just wanna be careful with your dinghies when you're close to shore or small boats when you're close to shore. And then the last B is be an advocate for our oceans. So there's a variety of different ways that you can be an advocate for our oceans. Um, we have a lot of boaters that come to us that wanna be a part of different citizen science projects. Um, and we have a couple of those on our website if people are interested in doing that. You could share messages with your community or you could also take action on a specific issue. So um, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk is plastic pollution, because it's an issue that we have the boating community continuously coming to us and wanting to do more about, because they see the problem you know, very visible on the water and they wanna do something about it. So just wanted to give you a little background on plastic pollution. 33 billion pounds of plastic enters our ocean every year. That's equivalent to two garbage trucks dumping plastic into the ocean every minute. And plastics have been found everywhere. They've been found floating in the middle of the ocean, melting out of sea ice at the deepest point of the ocean floor. Um, plastics are in our water, they're in our beer, they're everywhere. And, you know, they're just, the plastic waste is just increasing. So what the problem really comes down to is that companies are producing too much throwaway plastic. So I wanted to share a couple of plastic myths because I thought they were really interesting before I um, share some solutions. So I know this slide is complicated, um, but that's, that's kind of the point. But the first myth is that all plastics are recyclable. So I'm sure many of you have seen those, you know, three arrows that are chasing each other in a triangular loop on an item and you, you know, you've thought, hey, this package can and will be recycled, but that's not necessarily the case. So there are so many different types of plastic and this chart here represents the resin identification code system that was created by and for the plastic industry. So each number um, in that triangle signifies a different category of plastics. So if it's a one, it's you know, a clear plastic like a water bottle or a soda bottle. If it's a two, it's a heavier plastic like a milk jug or a detergent bottle. If it's a three, it's PVC, which includes plastic piping or vinyl flooring. A number four is low density PE. So that's your, anything that's really flexible like plastic bags or food wrapping. Number five are really tough plastics such as bottle lids or yogurt tubs. Um, number six is polystyrene or otherwise known as styrofoam. So that's your takeout containers or some, you know, some egg trays. And then finally, seven is my favorite. It's the catch-all category for all other types of plastics, which is aptly called other. Um, so if you look on the right-hand side, four, six, and seven are red and represents that they are not or are rarely, rarely recyclable. Threes and fives are often not recyclable. And ones and twos are recyclable, but they're not really recycled in any significant amount. And that leads to my second myth, which is the plas plastic bottle you threw into the recycle bin is going to turn into another plastic bottle. And that's what I assumed when I'm throwing the plastic bottles away. But most of the time it's downcycled, which means it's turned into something of lower quality. So it's actually cheaper to use virgin plastic to build a new bottle than it is to recycle the plastic into a, a bottle. And the problem with the downcycling is that these items can't be recycled again, which then cuts the items overall life cycle short. And then my last myth is recycling is an effective solution to the plastic pollution crisis. It's not. As you just saw, there are types of plastics that are not recyclable. Different types of plastics can contaminate our waste stream. Um, when plastics are recycled, they're you know, actually downcycled to a product of lesser value. And out of all the plastic waste ever produced, only 9% has, ever, has been effectively recycled. So that means 91% of plastic waste is either going to the landfill, being incinerated, or entering our environment and our oceans. And without immediate change, 
the total amount of plastic waste generated is expected to double by 2025. And so I'm sure you know many of you are already doing your part to reduce, reuse, and rethink you know your consumption of throwaway plastics. But I'm going to share a few tips um, and then talk about what we can do as a community to make a difference. So the first tip on board your boat is try to use instead of you know stocking your boat with a lot of single-use water bottles, try using a water filtration filtration system on board or you know, having large jugs of water that you're pouring into reusable, reusable bottles. You know, replace single-use items with reusables where you can. So instead of using single-use plastics, can you put it into silicone container or um, using you know, different types of reusable bags? There's a variety of different things that can be changed um, and prevent you from using single-use items. Another thing to do is to shop smart when you can. So if you buy products in bulk, that usually limits your plastic waste. Um, you know, buy, buy your food local if you can, and hopefully that also limits plastic waste. And then my last tip here is to support plastic-free companies and initiatives. So, you know, there's some companies that are really coming out with some unique um, ways to, to not use single-use plastic. For example, there's a company called Bite which makes toothpaste um, tablets instead of you know, using a toothpaste tube that's made out of plastic. They make these little tablets that come in a glass jar. Um, they also sell bamboo brushes, so you're not using a plastic toothbrush. You brush your teeth, you bite on the little tablet, you brush your teeth, um, and then they come in refillable glass jars that you send back to the company, they fill it back up and send it back to you. So that's, you know, you need more companies that are coming up with innovations like that. And then for initiatives, maybe you want to start a plastic free initiative locally, you could work with your club or marina or maybe even your local watering hole to try to help eliminate throwaway plastics. And you could start small with them and say like let's try to eliminate straws or you know only give straws on request um, or then move up to utensils and dinnerware and water bottles. So if a, a place becomes plastic free, they're not buying the single use plastic products from the producers. And it's a really great way to start on a local level. You know, we've seen a lot of success, especially through our Clean Regattas program um, with clubs that we've worked with over the years. Oops. But again, the reality is that throwaway plastics are still getting made in massive quantities. As consumers, we are not given a choice to not buy plastic. If you go to the grocery store, that everything is, feels like it's covered in plastic and it's really hard to find, like just in, even in this image, it's really hard to find things that are not wrapped in plastic. I think sometimes I see those funny images of like an orange that's, you know, in its orange peel, it's wrapped in plastic. Um, so we really need, you know, things to happen to get the single use plastics to go away. And even if you go to a restaurant or buy packages, it, a lot of it comes in plastic. So to stop plastic from entering our oceans, we must reduce the amount of throwaway plastic being created and produced. Um, and we're working to, to do that. So policies like plastic you know, bans can be very helpful way to reduce throwaway plastics. There's a lot of counties and cities that are starting to ban certain use plastics. And the focus of these bans is generally you know, what's the most common plastic waste found at a beach cleanup. So that's plastic bags, utensils, straws, and takeout containers. So for example, last year, New York State passed a ban on um, styrofoam material for takeout containers and packaging. Um, Washington State also just passed a comprehensive bill against um, polystyrene as well. And then Virginia and Maryland just passed um, a bill to stop the intentional release of balloons into the environment. So hopefully we'll start seeing less of those, those mylar and balloons in our, in our waterways. So one thing to do is keep on the lookout for opportunities to support these bans in your local region. And while we have momentum building on these local levels, we really need to you know, put our foot on the accelerator. So we are also working to call on the US government to pass legislation to help reduce ocean plastic pollution. Um, there's a new act called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. It's a first of its kind bill that was introduced to Congress and it would phase out certain single use plastics like the ones I mentioned, and then um, shift the burden of plastic waste to the companies producing it rather than the consumers like us. 
And finally, like I mentioned before, we really need companies to offer us plastic free choices. So maybe when you order your supplies for your boat online, they come wrapped in, wrapped in plastic. We recently launched a campaign targeting Amazon. Every day, thousands of products on Amazon are shipped with plastic wrapping and cushioning materials unnecessarily. In 2019 alone, Amazon shipped 7 billion packages. And so the amount of plastic waste, um, pa plastic packaging waste in the form of air pillows would circle the earth more than 500 times, which is pretty significant. And so we just want Amazon to offer customers a plastic free choice. So these are kind of a couple of the campaigns that we're working on and we have action alerts that if people are interested in, I'm happy to share, but we really are trying to reduce the production of throwaway plastics. Um, and with the help and support of ocean advocates on these initi initiatives, we can protect our beautiful oceans and wildlife from plastic pollution. So just to wrap up, um, how do we protect our waterways? The three Bs, be careful about what goes into the water, be aware of wildlife and habitat, and be an advocate for our oceans. And finally, if you're interested in joining our community of green boaters to hear about those action alerts, um, you can go to this link, sailorsforthesea.org slash PSC, and you can become a green boater. You get a, digital, a free digital copy of our green boating guide, which covers 28 different topics, including a lot of the, the eco tips, eco smart tips that I gave today. It's a pretty dense document, but it also has a top 10 checklist to give you things that you can do right now on, the, on um, protecting the water. And then we also send out, like I said, action alerts for different locations if you're interested in these different types of campaigns that we work on as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, here's my email, sbrown at oceana.org. So if you have any questions after this, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to, to share, um, answer your questions and answer your questions now. Well, I'll be the first one to say that was very educational, very informative and kind of shocking a little bit on some of those statistics. Um, I did have someone uh, messaging me via um, Meetup because they're, uh, their LinkedIn or their Zoom isn't working quite properly. Um, the question about um, how many boats worldwide empty their winter, quote unquote, non-toxic antifreeze directly in the harbors every spring. Um, is that a huge problem or is that how big of a problem is that relative to the other? That's a, that's a great question. I'd have to like look up how big of a problem that is, but I know there's two different types of antifreeze. One that's more eco-friendly than the other kind. Um, I'd have to look at my green, the green boating guide actually has an answer to that. Um, I can't think of the name at the top of my head, but there is a type of antifreeze that's less toxic to animals um, in the environment. But that, again, that's another thing that ends up in the water. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there was any research out specifically on antifreeze. Shelly, I had a question. I was quite <laughs> astounded when you talked about some of your myths of uh, use of plastic. And I believe if I heard you correctly, you said that only 9% of the recycled plastic actually goes in, is actually recycled and the rest goes to, could you elaborate on that? I was shocked at the low percentage. I think, I think of all of the people that live around me that dutifully put out their plastic bottles to the recycling truck every other week. And to think that uh, only 9% are being recycled and the rest go to a landfill. Could you comment on that and expand on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it's a huge, it's a huge problem. Um, so the rest either get landfilled, incinerated, end up in the ocean. But um, what's happening is, you know, we often, or we had in the past, often have been shipping our recycled materials to other countries to deal with. So throwing our waste away. Um, so it's like, you know, not seen um, in our hands. Um, but yeah, plastic, the problem with plastic is there's so many, like I said, there's so many different types of plastic. It's, it, you know, countries that are taking the plastic now, it has to be an extremely high quality of plastic, all the same type, it can't be contaminated. And the problem is, you know, if you don't wash out your plastic bottles, like get rid of all the food that's inside it, that's contaminated. If you're putting in things that aren't recyclable, different types of plastic that are not recyclable, that con contaminates the waste stream. So it's like all of those different things that add up that make it so that 
the plastic's not uh, effectively. It's like a, a variety of different things. But oftentimes, like we're shipping it to other places, but now their their quality levels are because there's so much because there's so much plastic being made. Um, their quality standards are pretty high, and it's often that we're not um, meeting those quality standards either. Oh wow! Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. That clarifies. I, I I hadn't thought about the seven varieties or whatever that you had listed there. You know, most of, only two of which I guess are easily recycled, and the rest are not. That's yeah, the, and then if you think like everybody sees those little triangles and are like, oh, I'm just going to throw that in. But even if you go from municipality to municipality, some people, some towns take it, some towns don't. Yeah. Um, so it can be really confusing if you're just throwing all of your plastic in there. Yeah. Like, I often think like, oh, the strawberry container, that's recyclable. It's not in a lot of places. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's really challenging. Wow. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions, comments, insight beyond <laughs> what Shelly gave us? So I've got a couple others that were written to me. But uh, I'd rather hear from somebody else. But if nobody's going to step up, um, microfibers. Um, what goes? Um, there was a microfibers expelled by effluent pipes um, and bypassing filters. Yeah. <laughs> um, apparently, um, Brian F is a uh, is is very well versed in this. So he, I think he's a big fan of your guys. Um, Going to get brought. You and Brian got to get together because he's Definitely. probably going to the organization right away. Um, he had a lot of stuff on here. Um, but how big of a problem is that? It's, it's a big problem. A lot of our clothes are made out of plastic materials and they just shed those tiny little microfibers. And every time you do laundry, it's like it's going into um, the waste stream and then going it does bypass filters. I know there's an organization called the Rosalia Project. I think they're based out of Maine and they developed a cool... I actually had it. It's a little, um, plastic device that helps pick up plastic microfibers um, that you just throw in your wash as well. And it can pick up like the different, I don't know how effective it is. If, I think they've done a lot of testing on it, but um, there's like some research out there. But again, a lot of our, if you think about it, a lot of our clothes are made out of plastic materials and not, not natural um, materials as well. So it's an, another big problem. That's why like the drinking water has tiny little plastics in it in our, our beer and honey and everything. Mm. Big problem. Wow. Even like clams, there's like research study of clams like that have the tiny little plastics um, in their stomachs. Because wow. they're fil filtering the water. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But that's, and I think that's why we focus on, you know, how can we, you know, slow the production, stop the production of plastics that are, are unnecessary because there are solutions or are there companies that can come up with innovative solutions? I think like, you know, there's probably organizations in the fashion industry that are trying to, you know, work with more natural materials that don't shed microfibers as much, um, but we need more of that and faster. Excellent. Anybody else got any questions, comments for Shelly? All righty. Oh. Well, Shelly, let me say thank you so much for a very informative presentation. And uh, if we had a if we had an in person meeting, I would present you with one of our caps, our embroidered oh. caps with pelagic. <laughs> That's but awesome. uh, what we'll do is in lieu of presenting it to you personally, we will send you one in the mail as a, as a token of our appreciation. Oh, that's so nice of you. Joining us tonight. It was wonderful. I learned a lot. Uh, I'm certainly going to look with our, our recycling system in Salem with a little more skeptical eye now that I understand more about what can be recycled and can't. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's it's a big eye opening. Lesson. Big, a big lesson. So, uh, yeah. again, Thanks so much. It was very, very uh, informative. And I know I learned something and I hope everyone that joined uh, did as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And you guys all sound like a great crew and a great club. Well, we have a lot of fun and that's our <laughs> I mission. can tell. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Well, thanks well, again. Thanks so much. Have a great yeah, rest of the day. Yeah, you bet. Um, so as for 